I'm going to flip things on their heads and start with the credits. So much of this talk came from a piece that I've just recently written for the Photographers Gallery in London for their Unthinking Photography platform. So thank you very much to Joanna Zulli for, uh, from Photographers Gallery, who was the editor for the piece. Um, so my article, Manifest Destiny in the Digital Age, was actually commissioned to be part of, uh, to, to be um, coinciding with the solo exhibition, She Who Sees the Unknown, by the artist Martian Aliyari, whose work is in constant dialogue with the theme of digital colonialism. Um, and also, I think this talk has a lot of relevance to um, Nora and Nikolai's presentation, so I hope that some of you saw that this morning. It was excellent. Otherwise, I think there's a recording. Um, yeah, so Morrison's work also is, 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 um, is looking at this, at, at this theme, especially from the, from the point of view of the digital capturing of cultural heritage in the Middle East and the global south by institutions from the global north, um, which is a, you know, a parallel from today of the veritable raiding of culturally significant artifacts that's been going on for centuries under the guise of anthropology, archaeology, and cultural preservation. So again, um, Nora and Nicola did an excellent job of describing that this morning. Um, so there's a lot of great work in decolonialization um, going on in, in many different fields and rethinking the status quo. Um, a lot of that's being led by artists, activists, writers, and thinkers. And I'd really like to acknowledge the intellectual leadership of a lot of amazing people of colour like Sarah Ahmed, the Walpuri scholar Steve Wantajampajimpa Patrick, Wendy Chun, Dorothy Santos, Nin Yamamoto Masson, Shone Holloway, E. Jane, um, and the Australian First Nations artist and filmmaker Jenny Fraser, who I've had the honour of working with many times. Um, and, who, and, and many other people who give of their knowledge and experience online. Um, and most of this talk would not be possible without the sharing, teaching and guidance of my artistic collaborators and friends at the Warniaka Art Centre in Central Australia. So a special thank you also to Neil Japrula cook and to Le Louisa Erglis and many more. So. Historically, the language that we use to describe the internet is, I think, really revealing. Um, the internet is often described as the new Wild West, a new frontier. Tech companies and startups on the cutting edge are entering uncharted territory. The people that push forward the expansion of network technologies are digital pioneers, and those who are born into its shadows are digital natives. And the myth has been sold to us that the internet will emancipate us and social media. Um, and by we or us, I mean in this context, those of us who are not tech oligarchs and are thus on the losing end of the power equation between people and the data or digital economy. So for the last 10 years at least, we've been told that the democratic sharing of information will make the world more transparent and thus necessarily more just. Forget the fact that algorithms governing our access to information through search engines or social media platforms, and just as a little aside here, I often think that there's a reason why they're called feeds. It's a word that implies um, a passivity and a resignation. So forget the fact that these algorithms are, are proprietary and utterly untransparent. Forget fake news and opaque value-driven censorship by privatized entities also known as social media companies and most startups these days. Forget also that in 2013, the US was home to eight of the top 10 internet companies, but only 19% of their users. And of course, do not allow yourself to consider the implications of such a one-sided export of cultural and social ideology and norms by such a small proportion of the world's population to the rest of it nor the amount of personal data that is flowing back towards the source from the global users. So this is another aspect of the siren server trope that Jaron Lanier describes. Information asymmetry is power asymmetry. And if data is the new oil in the 21st century, then internet users are the raw earth from which that oil is extracted. They are commodity to be exploited for the benefit of the oil barons. 
In this, there is at least some equity amongst users around the world. It's the parity of the powerless. Except that isn't accurate either. The explosion of internet and digital tech industries did not occur in an ahistorical environment. It was built upon existing inequities and hegemonic power structures that carry over from the colonial practices of the last four centuries. This specific international context, combined with the lack of regulation of the online space, has led to the creation of massive monopolies operating out of the global north, which exploit the whole world's nat uh, natural resources and labour, and hoover up the data of global citizens to generate more profit for themselves. And just as an aside to that last slide, there's a whole other aspect to like tax and tax evasion and where taxes are paid. That's another super interesting rabbit hole to go down about that whole thing. So here's a little bit of information. Nigeria is one of the more developed tech economies in Africa, and yet it imports 90% of the software that, are, that is used in the country. Africa as a continent is home to 14% of the world's population and accounts for 20% of the globe's land surface area, but only 2.6% of the worldwide geotagged Wikipedia articles. On every level, from how the human form is visualised online to the language bias, um, circa 60% of the internet is in English, compared to only 10-15% to of the world's population who speak the language. Um, or the w recurring whitewashing in digital pop culture, we see the overwhelming dominance of northern, western, urban, Anglo-Saxon imagery and values. So again, this is something that I really have gotten into the habit of doing, is when I'm, when I'm researching something, looking at just a simple Google image search of that particular thing. So this one, I think, is a, a pretty telling example of the way that the, the hive mind and the internet, the way that it kind of sees people. So this is just the image search for the keyword hand. We see the stark contrast between the people who produce the devices and the depiction of the people who use the devices. We see the tech oligarchs and their scantily covered colonialist tendencies. We see the global north's visioning of the global south and how this gaze is one that manipulates meaning to better suit a marketing message. So, for example, there was Facebook's controversial internet.org program, which has since been rebranded as Free Basics. And the reason I've got this slide up here at the moment with the before Pepsi, there was Facebook. So, that recent Pepsi ad that caused a, a huge amount of controversy where they were trying to sell their product by mimicking this kind of protest. Well, this, still, this is a still from an ad that was run in India when um, Facebook initially released its internet.org program. Um, and it's really co-opting those same kinds of strategies of using this idea of like power to the people to actually just get people using their service. Digitalization seems increasingly to be preserving the existing colonialist power and wealth structures between the global north and the global south. The internet favours those with time and money, especially those who speak English and have access to high-speed internet and a personal computer. Um, so rather than having a shared computer, for example, at internet cafes or only a smartphone as the main source of internet access, I'd really like to see some of the Silicon Valley tech types trying to do all their coding on a smartphone. Um, it allows these people to control the discourse to document the present, set the course for the future, and literally to rewrite history. We are living through an era of a huge orchestrated, even if unintentionally, erasure of marginalised and poorer sections of the world's population, their histories, their culture. This is a tool that's classically used in colonial expansion, um, and I could talk about this for quite a long time, but I just wanted to touch on this idea. Um, this is one of my collaborators. His name's Wanta Jumpajimpa Patrick. He's a Walpuri Indigenous Australian man. And I'm not sure how much this audience knows about colonial Australian history, but when the white settlers arrived in Australia, they declared the land terra nullius, which means... Um, an empty land. And so since that point of time, there's been incredibly layered and complex um, strategies employed 
to portray First Nations peoples as primitive. So that ranges from everything from saying that they wandered the desert, like as though it was this kind of aimless wandering, um, which it wasn't, um, to saying that they were hunter-gatherers, which they weren't. I mean, they, they, they gathered things, but they also, and they hunted things, but they also farmed the land on, on a massive, massive scale and in a very um, nuanced and highly developed way. Um, and so this is just a little quote from, from um, Wanta when we were in London last year for an exhibition that we did there together. And the exhibition, um, or the piece that we did, combines traditional designs on, as a wall painting in the gallery space with screens and video works and a whole lot of selfies by, by the community members. And uh, in, in an interview, Jumpy Jumper said, uh, he referred to the screens as this so-called technology. And I just thought that it was so perfect because it encapsulated so much of the kind of resistance that I was feeling myself towards this notion of, or like this narrative about progress always with technology and that it's always this kind of movement forwards or upwards. Um, and also it spoke, I think, a lot to, to um, an indigenous or, you know, a Walpuri approach to technology, which is really much, very much about, it's simply another way to express the same message or the same messages which come out of culture and, and tradition and um, a deep understanding of the world and the time. So, but yeah, <laughs> another thing to maybe add there is that I think Walpri have a particularly um, deep understanding of cyberspace because their cultural um, heritage is, or I've, I've heard arguments about it, I wouldn't want to put words into anybody's mouth, but the, there is this sense that it kind of exists as a sort of cyberspace itself because they're, they're, li they're living in this, in this world that exists um, in the current time, but also in the past time with ancestral spirits, and there's this connection to the land. There's a lot of different aspects that are much less linear than, and chronological than, than our understanding of the world. The new colonial powers are the digital nation states of companies like Facebook, Google, Apple, each with their own draconian border laws and hostile foreign policies. Facebook makes no secrets of its designs on empire. It wants to be the medium through which all our online communications take place, which is why it's busy buying up apps and patents across all modes, instant messaging, VR, AR, and more. Google's aggressive expansion into new realms of business, archiving, and research is mercurial, creating a vacuum into which talent, competitors, and capital alike are sucked. Even in its astonishingly greeting, greedy approach to archiving, though, there is a clearly colonialistic hierarchy of what is deemed culturally and historically valuable. So just as an example, the vast majority of books proposed to be scanned for the Google's Books Project are in English. So the closer a user is to the cultural value assumptions of the fenced off online territory of the service provider they are using, the more likely they are to benefit from it, however peripherally the more chance they have of one day joining its ranks and becoming an insider, and the more validation they receive from the media they consume. The more culturally relevant content that is available for them. In fact, if you think about this through the framework of cost or value for money, like for example, per megabyte of culturally relevant content, it radically shifts the value for money of huge tracts of the internet depending on the user's background. We're living through a digitally camouflaged rebirth of the concept of manifest destiny. We are watching wannabe world powers staking out their territory, backed by the armory of their superior computing power. The difference now is that the maps on which they are drawing lines chart the, ter the terrain of attention, which translates into earning potential and, above all, data. So, now we're entering slowly into the hopefully more upbeat section of this presentation. Um, the Waniaka Art Centre is an Aboriginal owned and operated art and cultural centre in the Walpuri Indigenous community of Lajamanu. Lajamanu is an incredibly remote place. It's located in central Australia, about 900 kilometres south of Darwin, and it's about 700 kilometres from the nearest town services. 
So the collaboration um, between the Art Centre, which includes dozens of artists and staff, and myself, has been consistently productive since 2012. I've visited the Art Centre several times for residencies for a total of over six months and have also hosted several artists on a number of occasions in Germany, where, where I'm currently based, and Europe. And that's important because this relationship, I think, gives us the ability to work on um, different kinds of context, um, content. So um, I wanted to show this image. This is um, an image that it comes from a database um, that, the, that the Art Centre and I um, worked, have been working on in the last years. Um, so during the kind of time of working together over the last at least five years um, and deepening this relationship, we began to talk a lot about the innovative and creative ways that communi community members were using their phones. So in La Germania, as in, I think, a lot of parts in Africa and in other places around the world, very few people have a personal computer that they have in their homes. They, they access the internet through smartphones. And um, we began talking about the way that people are, are taking photos and the apps that they're using to decorate and, and manipulate the photos that they're taking. And we began to collect, well, when I say we, I mean the art centre, began to collect um, some of these images uh, and to create a kind of database of something that you might call outsider digital art. Um, and I personally think that a lot of this is just, you know, something that all of us in this room probably do too, which is that, that, that um, drive to sort of document our lives and, and to see ourselves. But I think there's also a deeper, a deeper thing that's going on here, which is about the lack of culturally relevant imagery in the media. Um, Aboriginal people in Australia are, it's, it's maybe slightly improving in the last years, but they're basically invisible in the media unless it's a negative story, actually. Um, and often, you might see imagery of Aboriginal art without seeing imagery or hearing from Aboriginal people themselves. So this has led us to a project that we're currently working on at the moment. And it's an app. It's called Mirror Worry. And it's been designed um, between myself and the Art Centre, taking into account both of our kind of goals. And it's been really fantastic because it's such a win-win um, collaboration. So from, from the um, art centre side and the artist side, they're really interested in, in having um, an app that is culturally relevant to them. So instead of taking selfies or taking baby photos with a, a picture frame that is maybe about snow and Christmas or a sunset over, over the ocean, um, they have, we've, we've been working on developing an app that is totally populated with Walpuri content, Walpuri relevant content. And I mean, as, a, as, as an outsider to that, to that art and to that community, it's just also stunningly beautiful, you know? So on the left, you can see um, my kind of version of the Snapchat flower crown, but in a, a Walpuri way. And so what we've developed is a series of frames that you, can, that you can interact with. And then there's also what we're calling masks, which are basically like a kind of still image that you can interact with live with your, on your camera. And then there's a whole series of these Walpri emoji or digital stickers. So for the, for the Walpri elders in the community, the cultural advisors at the Art Center, it was really important that the, um, that the app include a lot of um, of relevant information and kind of um, building blocks that they can use to teach younger members of the community about their cultural heritage. So they can um, put together the Kurawari designs, which are the designs that make up a Dreamtime story in Aboriginal culture. And it's very specific to each family and to each cultural group. Um, and then there's also a lot of just fun things from around their community. So there's, they went out and they were taking photos around the community, which we've then turned into also these kinds of stickers that they can use to decorate their photos. And, and from my point of view um, and the research that I've been doing, this is a really beautiful gesture against digital colonialism. It's reversing the trend of only importing software and cultural content, and it's about sharing that message with the outside world. And I mean, I think a lot of people at the Art Center are really um, motivated by this idea to let other people know that their culture is still alive and that it's a, um, and to, to, yeah, to be able to kind of 
see themselves outside of their own small community. So it is something like sending a bottle from the central Australian desert to the rest of the world. And we're really excited to see how, how it's going to be used around the world, and we're really looking forward to that. So the scheduled launch is in June, and we'll be monitoring and sharing user-generated content, um, potentially incorporating some of the publicly uploaded pieces into a physical installation um, of the piece, which will be shown in an exhibition that I'm curating later in the year in Germany, um, which is the sec second iteration of this exhibition. It's called Networking the Unseen. Um, I think that's about it for, for right now.